it never really tried to explain the Nazca lines or spontaneous combustion or lights in the sky over Roswell, beyond the theories of a few who always had a bit of a far-out theory on everything. If it had tried to explain things, it would ultimately have ceased to be the unexplained, and that would have been no good to anyone. Nor would the leather and binder, for that matter. I fear the Bermuda Triangle Enigma, Channel 5, is heading in the wrong direction with the first episode devoted to showing how a particular patch of ocean can be especially prone to boats going down. Presenters Rick Edwards and Ortis Daly did a very good and workmanlike job of this, explaining how three storm fronts knit together in the million square miles of the triangle, reaching top speeds from their respective starting points in the Florida swamps, the Caribbean and the Atlantic. They showed us how so-called rogue waves can overcome the biggest of vessels in such a maritime region and drew a clear and very reasonable link between pleasure ports like Miami and the amount of unst sailors who go missing after heading out from their deceptively calm waters without a clue as to what might happen if they find themselves in water less calm. These weren't so much secrets of the Bermuda Triangle as the down-to-earth facts of it, and when put next to people who still insisted on believing there were forces at work out there, along with energy fields and other such hogwash. It was obvious which side most people would plump for. Trouble is, most mysteries, once solved, are often very dull and I for one would rather have some vague idea of a place in the ocean where things disappear all the time than the reality of a bit of water that just has a lot of storms and is visited by a great many stupid sailors. There's only really one mystery left to ponder, which is how they're planning to squeeze three episodes out of telling us there's no mystery. If you look twitchy at the start of this three-part adventure, our guy in Russia, Channel 4, was definitely showing the strain on the final leg, which had the likable lorry mechanic touring the closed zone around Chernobyl. A region the size of Derbyshire is still so radioactive that visitors like Guy, and, bizarrely enough a Belgian photography club who were on a pleasure trip there at the same time, have to wear monitors that begin to glow an ever more eerie shade of green as the Geiger count goes up. At the root of it all, we were reminded more than once, was Cold War I upmanship and the Soviets' desire to prove they could build the fastest, biggest, cheapest reactors. I'm not sure how reassuring that was and it didn't seem to have a calming effect on our guy. They could, in fact, by not making them safe, although when asked why their new reactor didn't have a special shield like all those ones in the evil capitalist West, the Soviets said they didn't need one. Strange they didn't put it there then. The Chernobyl reactor was so safe. They said that it could be put up in Red Square.